While uh, looking at this image uh, we saw last week of Velasquez painting of Apollo coming to the forge of Hephaestus Vulcan to announce that his wife Venus was in bed with Mars. <clears throat> I'll just tell you where we're headed today. I, there's more of the story of Athena and um, that I want to um, pick up on. It's just where we left off last time. And then we'll start in with Apollo about whom there are so many stories and so many really extraordinary works of art that I'm sure you will be looking at Apollo next week as well. So to refresh you, this is the very last image we looked at by a, a man who was a slightly younger contemporary of Rubens on a design very much like a Rubens and maybe based on a, a Rubens sketch of the Banquet of the Gods. This was to, uh, launches us into the series we're going to deal next. Um, and this was the <laughs> story that sets up the competition between the three goddesses, Aphrodite, <laughs> Juno, or Hera, the <laughs> gods, and Minerva, or Athena, about who is the fairest of them all. The contest came about because this figure up here who represents fury or strife had not been invited to the banquet. And so she tossed this uh, golden apple on the table and it was just inscribed to the fairest of them all. And here all three women are sort of through their gestures trying to explain why, well, naturally it goes to me. And Zeus, who looks already pretty careworn dealing with these women, uh, as you see him right here, uh, makes the canny move. He actually fobs the decision off on humanity rather than any other god. So he has um, Mercury, the messenger god, and that would be, this would be Mercury we know because he wears his messenger cap. Go down to earth to Troy, where um, he will come to a young, handsome lad named Paris, uh, who thought of himself as just a simple shepherd, but who was actually the son of the king of Troy, Priam, who had been abandoned when he was an infant because it had been foretold that he would bring about the fall of Troy. So um, Priam was to choose which of these three women was the most beautiful. And so now we're going to look at a whole series of images. Uh, it's just the shorthand title for them all is The Judgment of Paris. Here's an extremely static one. Um, again, a Pompeian fresco. <clears throat> the reason I keep going back to these is I keep going back to images on Greek pots, which we will have more of later today, is because there the, and some mosaics, are the only surviving substantial material we have about what ancient painting looked like. And we know that um, painting, that, at least to the people of the time, was thought to be realistic, was a very major art in, in Greece. And <clears throat> one of the great stories about it is there was a competition between two painters. And one made a picture that had grapes on it that was so convincingly real that birds came down to peck at the grapes. And his competitor, uh, not to be outdone, then made a picture that looked like it had a sort of like a gauzy curtain over it. So, uh, so when painter A, who had done the one with the grapes, looked at it, he tried to brush the curtain away so he could see it better. And of course, that meant that Painter B, who did the one with the curtain, had not only fooled birds, but had been able to fool another artist. <clears throat> so, and of course, now their idea of what was realistic doesn't necessarily mean that we, um, in our tradition, understand realism in the same way. But there was that goal. And um, 
paintings like sculpture were there to tell stories. And in Pompeii, it seems in, this is a suspicion largely, a lot of these painters that just, you can see these are like really hack works uh, in the way they're done, but uh, are done by local artists who had, we don't know on what source they had these images, and plastered boards, something that they carried around with them, images of famous works of art. And then they would copy them onto the walls of the rooms of the houses of the um, middle class and upper middle class living in Pompeii. The same reason, same source for the mosaics. So um, this is one version of the story. We're gonna, there are several versions of it. Because you can see here, it's, it's only fair, fair Venus who reveals herself and the other two goddesses here, Minerva here, you know, are fully clad. And here's extremely like a boy in a play who's just really not involved in what he's supposed to do on the stage. He's looking off over here, that's Mercury. And there are some four mosaics now to put something like this in a floor mosaic, you know, if, if you were designing it as a floor scene, you wouldn't take this because in the room, there's no one particular way where looking at it should be right. You know, I mean, there's a, an orientation, of course, you'd be looking down at figures. I mean, this is more like something ought to be on the wall. But there, there are these three, they're first and second century AD. This is, um, the most uh, charmingly naive of the three. She looks pretty bored, doesn't she? And this one is kind of more cleverly designed to fit into the space, this circular design. So it's been split, the three goddesses back here, and just the moment when the apple is being handled to a, handed to a <clears throat> very fully clad Paris here. And there's his sheepdog and his sheep brother. You know, this is done at a time when um, the realism, the concept of realism was somewhat different from us. These little gray wedges you see at the bottom, where, no, where, 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 like this, that would be cast shadow. Well, sometimes there are different angles from the figures and there's no continuous landscape or, or setting, but something of the sort. And a far more elaborate one, which probably is a faithful reproduction of a Hellenistic Greek, maybe that'd be third or second century BC painting. This was in the center of a floor of a, the house of a very wealthy family um, living in the area of, um, southern Turkey, it's now called Antakya, where by chance they discovered a, a, a set of villas with, with gorgeous floor mosaics. And you see how far more elaborate this one is. And then here's a medieval example. This is a 15th century uh, manuscript um, of a, a book by a woman named Christine de Pizan uh, who, because her husband died when her children were young, had to support the family and she did by writing. And her writings were very popular. This uh, is an illustration from a manuscript that was given to the wife of the King of France. Um, the contemporary king had periods of madness and his wife was the one who really ruled the country. And she was quite well educated. So this is 15th century, as I say, but something characteristic, especially of the Northern European works of art is that they still um, cling to um, tradition of dress and behavior and figure style um, of their time and of their region rather than immediately plunging into imitating classical antiquity. So, here we have our very medieval Paris with this quite large apple here. And it's not altogether clear 
except by perhaps her, the way she's approaching Paris, that this would be Venus. They are three well-dressed, um, <clears throat> warmly cloaked French princesses or queens actually. This is one from the early 16th century. This one I just, just think is marvelously funny. <clears throat> By a Swiss artist who's, I mean, his name is, I'd never heard of him. But um, he did it for someone, there's up here somewhere, these three balls that show up in the, this here and here this one here and here. The, um, they think probably the coat of arms of the um, man who paid for it. It's on canvas and it's big, it's about five feet high. Presumably this is a portrait of the man in the guise of Paris. The three women um, are unlikely to represent individuals. They're, they're, you can see the faces are just of a type. It's clear that this would be Venus. This is not a uh, pregnant Venus, but the same thing applies here as it did with Arnolfini in that wedding with a um, bride in her green gown. This is the ideal beauty in Northern Europe. Um, the ideal beauty as of a woman as um, fecund, that, that the idea that, that this swelling belly is, that she's going to, she's right, she will bear children. Uh, she has a childbearing body. And that was still even in Rembrandt's day, the preferred Northern female type. And then the central woman is also dressed in Swiss, German Swiss costume of the time. The background is full of leaves back here. That's a little bit like a tapestry. And this is, since it's big, this is probably, this guy probably couldn't afford a tapestry and commissioned this painting. They would be hung against the wall in the same way. The German artist who's of the early 16th century, who's more famous, especially for doing this and many other paintings, Lucas Cranach, C-R-A-N-A-C-H. And he and his studio turned out some two dozen of these Paris, and the three um, goddesses. It's an extraordinary version. I mean, how does, this is contemporary armor, it's parade armor, but it's actually not based on the Iliad. There were two other sort of medieval prose poems that told the same story. Um, and in one of them, um, Paris has been out hunting for the day an exhausted, he tethers his horse and he just lies down to take a nap. And in his nap, Mercury appears. This would be Mercury. Uh, um, this is his winged helmet here. <clears throat> and instead of the apple, it's a crystal orb. And then the goddesses appear. So he's to judge between the three. So that's one version. And you can see Cranach is who, by the way, was a very good friend of Martin Luther, um, is sort of uncomfortably straddling the combination of a classical Venus figure, especially in the central one, and the shape of their breasts um, and their short-waistedness, and then the Northern standard. So he's, the classical Italian ideas are infiltrating in the North, um, being accommodated to local tastes. And this is one that's in the Met. It's about four feet high. And there are these marvelous landscapes. You see it's a proper Alpine landscape. So it's been brought from Troy to Northern Europe. And these ladies, with their, they're quite nonchalant. This one with a great plumed hat. He looks stunned by him his task and this apparition of these three ladies. Uh, look at this one looking out at you. 
Give you two more. Well, first, this is the detail. This, so you think of the whole thing as four foot high. So you see, it's, it has this kind of really fine detail, which was so appreciated in Northern art. And what fabulous headdress he has here. It does provide the wings, but now it's birds eating this. And this wonderful crystal orb. Her nice ringlets, some tendrils of her hair escaping back here. Yet another version, and in this one, here's Cupid about to zing with an arrow. She's saying, me, bring it to me. <laughs> and another one, where she's just incredibly coy. Now, no one today knows exactly what the message was of these. I mean, why was this so popular? Um, the first speculation wall had been, of course, it'd be made for the male patron, presumably is presenting himself here as Paris. <clears throat> but since the faces of the women are all so generic in a single painting, it's unlikely that he's presenting his wife or his mistress or his mistresses, because um, that's always one possibility. Or then there's another possibility, well, maybe these three women represent the three ways of life, the contemplative life, the active life, and the, um, so Juno would be contemplative and active would be Minerva, and then the voluptuary life, and that would be Venus. And someone else has said, well, maybe this has something to do with alchemical principles. We don't know. But they're just, just imagine a friend of Martin, uh, Martin Luther turning out those paintings. Oh, I had that in the wrong place. Sorry, go ahead there. Now, this is the mid 17th century. It's very old fashioned in style, but just talk about how pervasive the popularity of this. You can see that this is an embroidery, it's an English embroidery. There's the hunting dog, the little lamb. They're quite startled. Paris about to receive a parrot. You've got your Minerva. Now this would be Juna because uh, she has whole realms in her, at her command. And she has her peacock under her. That's in... Um, the Detroit Museum. And then as it will always be when we're dealing with classical subjects, we return to Rubens. Uh, now Rubens did three versions and uh, just, oh, well, he did more than three, but I've got three to show you. This one he did when he was only about 20. Um, and it's about mm, not quite three feet high and it's in the uh, London National Gallery. So he's handing the apple here, of course, to Venus, who can always be identified because there's her clinging youngster. There is more to the painting. There's the river god over here that is cut off by this slide. Now there is some um, impending drama. When you look at her face, you should see that she is not at all pleased with his decision. Here, this is, um, who is this now? Minerva. She really hasn't um, reacted as yet, but this does allow the young Rubens to display his growing knowledge of human anatomy, which he's getting partly from studying um, engravings of classical sculpture rather than just human bodies because this splendid back is based on, on a Hellenistic Greek sculpture. But um, 
So he gets to show from the back, from the front, turning in one direction, turning in another. This is about 20 years later than that. This is in the Prado, and this is about um, six and a half feet high. And this was on, on canvas, and it's a much more loosely painted work. The one version of the story is that Paris, upon seeing these three goddesses, could not decide. So he asked them to disrobe so they could admire them in their full glory. And you see that's what's going on here, that they are disrobing. And here's Mercury just as interested and keenly enjoying his fellow goddesses as the mortal is. Now, they'll have their attributes. So we know this is Juno, because there's her peacock. And of course, this is going to be fair-haired Venus right here with her youngster looking out at us. And then Minerva, the goddess of war with her shield with the Gorgon's head on it. And up here is her owl all played against this wonderful landscape of the kind he'd learned from having observed many paintings by Titian when he was in um, working in the court in Spain where there were many Titian paintings already in the collection. And this third one, which is in the Prado, which was a, a, a commission from King Philip of, of Spain. So now the figures are brought right up close. You can see them, look at this. Well, no, not there. Another sign of his being kind of young in doing this, he's still learning as a painter. These figures are kind of just lined up across the front and then there's a backdrop behind them. Now here, he's mastered how to make some foreground background. So if there's a, a continuous land that you, we can walk from here all the way into that, past those sheep, all the way back to the trees, into the skyline. And here he kind of comes back to the way he did it before, but it's, it does literally foreground these, these marvelously buxom um, goddesses. And <clears throat> this is based on the classical sculpture. But here you have him sort of stroking his chin as he's making this very difficult decision. We'll see these ladies appear again later. What a hymn of praise to everything sensuous and touchable. And I thought you might need a corrective after those three very rich paintings. This is by um, an American, a, a woman named Eleanor Anton. Um, she did this about 15 years ago. She's a filmmaker, a feminist scholar, photographer, she's creative in a whole realm of ways. And so she does this feminist version of this, the last one that we looked at. So with that in mind, look at it once more. There's Minerva. There's, I mean, now, and all I can think of why this should be Juno, she does sort of have like a bow as if it were a crown. And I suppose this is a sort of a take on the 50s housewives, you know, dressed in their pearls and ready for their husbands to come home. So I think it's, that's very witty. She, she got a Guggenheim at one point.
Then this is one by Claude Lorraine. This is about, oh, about 10, 10 years different from, from between this one and Rubens' painting, but uh, you just see what a variety of um, takes that subject. <clears throat> Claude Lorraine is a French artist. So he's in his day and still most famous for landscapes. The figures are just there to give a justification for the landscapes. Uh, so here's the, well, of course, you recognize the subject. And here is, I guess that's Venus. Just, no, no, no. Who's that going to be there? So that's Minerva at the back of the, the, the lance, I guess. Because the subject of this painting is not just that you can walk back into the landscape. The walking back into the landscape is the reason for the painting. You have this wonderful winding river. It's a kind of a device often used in paintings of landscape. A, a river or a road that gives you in your imagination some way to move further and further back. And this is some, another indication of a constructed, sort of like a, a mental construct of a landscape is that you're going to have a logical way of framing the scene. Your eye isn't just wandering off to the sides by having major closing on one side, say like with these big trees, and then at least something to close it off on the opposite side, just this little bit here. There's sort of like a stage flats. But he was famous for these landscapes. His paintings are prized by Frenchmen in France and those who knew him in Rome, where he spent most of his time. Well, the English eccentric poet, visionary artist, William Blake did the same subject in this watercolor that he did for um, his patron. Now, sometimes what all is meant by his works is, is <laughs> almost as speculative as chronics, but uh, there's this, these great swirling forms, this kind of romantic style is typical of his work. And Renoir who was almost as fascinated by lavish female flesh as Rubens was. And this is based on that last one that, that's in the Prado. When um, Renoir did this, this was about 1910, he was about 70 and suffered, oh well, he's terribly afflicted with, with uh, with rheumatism, he sometimes had to have brushes attached to his wrists so that he could paint, but he just continued to work. And I'll show you a couple of the drawings he did for this uh, as well. This is a typical uh, Renoir late style, the sort of rosier colors and this very loose sort of a furry brushwork. Here's his first sketch. Now, she looks like a very human young lady here, leaning over to take whatever this is, almost as if she's testing something in the market. So that's kind of based on real observation. And then look how it's going to be turned into something theatrical and staged by the time we get to the end. There's that. And he did this chalk drawing version. the final painting. And then uh, at the encouragement of another artist, he had someone make a, a bronze of it as well. And this is the clay model for the bronze. The bronze is in the Cleveland Museum. And the last two I'll show you are by Cezanne. And they are also very amusing. This is one Cezanne did early in his career in his so-called ballsy period. They're, they're just young man's fantasy, a lot of them. But see, he, so he, he's not taking exactly the moment, but he's 
which he knew. I mean, he was a well, he had, Cezanne had a very good um, classical education as a student. So here he, ha he has the Paris sort of passing the apple back. So here, you take it, you take it. And they're, they're rejecting the apple. You see, he hasn't yet developed that characteristic um, laying on brushwork that he will later, but he did another one too. This one's in a private collection. And I don't know anything about this, but <laughs> now he's in Paris and saying, hey, goddess, take all those apples, please just take them. And these are figures he will work out in his great series of the bathers. All right, so we're gonna say goodbye to, I'm gonna say goodbye, you have to say goodbye to the stories about Athena now. And we're moving on to Apollo. Um, I'm going to start with a number of sculptures of him. First, tell you a little about the myth, and then we'll get into. Um, ultimately, we'll get to some of the myths as well. So Apollo, I read in Wikipedia, is called the most Greek of all the gods. Well, the one thing is that there are so many stories about him. And uh, he was the god of so many facets of human life. He is the god of music. Um, he supposedly invented this instrument, the kithra, which is like a lyre. Um, he was the god of athletics. He was the god of, it's called medicine, but it's, it's about things to do with, the God of things to do with the body. Let us put it that way, because he both cured people of the plague or diseases, and he also inflicted the plague. So uh, he was a prophetic God. Um, he had an oracle that could foretell the future. Uh, he was the God for the founding of new cities. Uh, he was the protector of all young men. Um, Several others as well, but we'll stay with those. Well, he had, um, so the myth, the, the background, he was the son of a Titan who was married to Titan, I guess you'd say, married to Zeus, a, a woman named Leto, L-E-T-O. And he had a, a twin sister, either Artemis or in Latin, then it would be Diana. And that's, although Leto is the, I'm telling you this for a reason that probably won't appear till next week, but uh, Leto was the goddess and um, protector of all childbirth and children in general. Um, Apollo and Artemis were her only two children. So uh, let's see which story do I want to start with. Well, we'll see how they come out first. We'll, we'll just uh, begin with some images. This is a Roman statue. It's uh, over life size of one of the uh, kinds of Apollo because I brought in ones that these images reflect different facets of his, his character. And it's not just clothed or unclothed, it, the different range of exploits associated with him. So here he is as the inspired musician and as the leader of the nine, or sometimes five, or sometimes three, muses, the sort of the goddesses of all realms of human knowledge. And as I say, he was the founder of this, um, first to play a stringed instrument, this kithara, you know, I, I didn't know until I thought about it. This is the source of the word guitar, kithara. That's, Guitars descended from that word, uh, was an instrument originally made out of a tortoise shell that uh, Mercury had made for him. And it was supposedly a very difficult instrument to play so that young Athenian upper class boys, this is part of their education, was not only athletics, but they could learn to play this as well. So here he is striding along, clothed, clothed in the uh, garb of a um, a uh, priest songster, a kind of a, a, a bard like Homer. 
So here you, you see him attached with the realms of culture. And all of these have different names among the specialists. Oh, that's a, you know, that's a Apollo Lycaos, that's an Apollo Saractonus. <laughs> but I'll just give you, I doubt that you need to know the names, but just to show you how differently he's visualized. This is again an over life size figure. This was found in a temple of Apollo in Cyrene in Libya. And it's a, a Roman sculpture, like the last. And in both cases, they're presumed to be Roman copies of something that was created it, uh, in some period of, oh, well, maybe fourth through first century BC. So here's his instrument. This is, of course, more badly damaged here. And then when you look at him, uh, I imagine you're struck by the kind of the sway in his pose and the softness in his facial features. That's, there's a, a quality of a kind of considerable femininity in it. And uh, look at his clothing. He just has a piece of cloth draped over one shoulder, then across his back, and then swinging around and held up over his leg here. Uh, and of course that, that emphasizes his sexuality. And he does have a very um, muscled torso of a man. So he's sort of androgynous and that was favored in, in a lot of the Hellenistic images of him. Now his hairstyle with this long hair that's the hairstyle of a young man in Athens. Um, one of the ceremonies for um, well-born Greek boys, when they came of age, is that their hair was cut and they made a present of their hair to Apollo. Young girls gave their toys to his sister, Artemis, instead. So he's youthful, male, female. We have his musical instrument. And then what's this all down here? Well, that refers to yet another aspect of his character as the god of prophecy. For that, the name is God Pythios. As we'll see, his main shrine was at Delphi, which is just 100 miles from Athens, on Mount Parnassus, which is also the home of the Muses. And on this mountain, there was an oracle. And the oracle was the domain, uh, the site of this monstrous snake called Pythios or Python, from which, of course, we get pythons. And uh, Python, Pythios, would not allow oracle to be established there by Apollo. So one of Apollo's great mighty feats was, was to slay the python. And then his oracle replaced that of Pythios. So that's a reference to his, one of his exploits and another one of his virtues. So he's athlete, musician, oracle in these and youth. And this is a type, oh my goodness, there are so many copies of this in clay, in stone, in reliefs, in freestanding sculpture. Um, everywhere in the Roman world. When you look at it, you already know that ah, this can't be an original. The original must have been bronze because look at this and this and this. Utterly, outrageously unnecessary if this were a bronze statue. As the original was, and it was by Praxiteles, that same marvelous fourth century sculptor who created this figure of Aphrodite. So Praxiteles came up with sort of stories involved with the gods and he brought them uh, into activity. He, he gave them a kind of a humanity that earlier religion really hadn't countenanced. So here, he would have had to lean against something in that pose uh, <clears throat> because the essence of this pose is that, <clears throat> excuse me, he's just shown as very weary. The, the key feature is the way his right arm is just over his head and he's just leaning back here, just 
utterly relaxed. So he doesn't display any of those virtues. He just displays the beauty of his body. Now, the original of this also was by Praxiteles, and this also has a gazillion copies in the Roman world. You would have it in your, in your villa or you'd have it in your gardens. <clears throat> and it's, it's just called Apollo the Lizard Slayer. And it was, this is really playing very lightly with the god. Um, he's shown now just as an adolescent. And here's this lizard clambering, you know, making its way up the tree. This part has been a, is a restoration, but it's clear that what he was doing is that he was about to clap his hand over this, capture this, and then he held an arrow and he was going to pierce it. So although that's like a kid playing with and abusing an animal, uh, it was like a forerunner of what he's going to do to that great python. Here's another angle of it. In the last just statue of Apollo show is this Apollo Belvedere. It's found not too far from Rome. <clears throat> and it was bought by the man who became Pope Julius II, who when he moved to the Vatican, took this statue with him and it's now in the Vatican collection. Uh, so here he is in his role as an archer. He had a quiver of golden arrows. Um, there's a strap for the quiver, which is here behind his back. And originally he held the bow. Um, presumably he has just released an arrow, looking at something we have no idea what. And to display his body now, you have the contrast with it. his cloak cast back over his shoulder. Later on, this, oh, this one became so famous. Uh, one of the first um, German scholars who sort of founded art history said, <clears throat> just, I don't even know how you can say it, but appropriately how, how much he enjoyed this sculpture. But he said it was one of noble, um, noble simplicity and grandeur. There in the head. He still has his youthful ringlets, which are all gathered up and piled on top of his head in this double knot. So this is the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, um, which chief center. Although there are temples to Apollo still surviving, scattered all over the Greco-Roman world. <clears throat> I'm assuming some of you well-traveled people have been there. Um, it is an absolutely spectacular site. And if you stand in the right places, you can see all the way down to the Mediterranean around here. So this is where people came to get a divination from the Oracle. Um, this temple, was um, the original temple to Apollo on this site. It was from the seventh century and it collapsed a couple of times in earthquakes. And it's only even been partly reconstructed to get an idea of its size from a tourist right here. Now there's a lot that went on here at this site at Delphi, in addition to the people coming to, to get some oracular announcement. This is a model of the site, part of the site. You see back here a stadium. Oh, it's an amphitheater. What you can't see was that there was a stadium, a race course back over here. <clears throat> Every few, four years at Delphi, um, as in Athens and at Olympia, they had games. And at Delphi, there were musical contests and then um, sporting contests. Uh, all the, the skills that a, an elite young man needed. And these smaller buildings generally are treasuries of the separate uh, Greek city-states 
where they kept their prizes and their, um, that they'd won, their athletes had won at these different contests. I love this. this is so terrible. Isn't it just, oh my goodness, what an awful reconstruction. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> different temple. This is the temple of Zeus at Olympia, which was made in the fifth century. And oh, not going to, well, it's, the reason for it is I'm going to show you the sculpture that's at the other end of the building than the, this main entrance here. Uh, the sculpture, uh, the sculpture survives in good condition, which is amazing because the whole temple was um, is just was reduced to rubble in a flood, and there were pieces were found scattered over a great distance in the site, but enough so they know how to imagine what it looked like originally, and enough of the original sculpture survives. So we're going to be looking at the sculpture in the pediment. And that's of course this triangle up here. Um, a headache for any Greek designer because the sculptures on temples didn't, for the Greeks, didn't necessarily refer in any direct way to whatever God was worshiped inside, but they were important storytelling moments. They were didactic and dramatic stories. And so they weren't, just like a floral decoration or something like that to put in here. With that in mind, then you're stuck with this nasty format because the Greeks, even for their gods, um, treated them as if they were ranged in size as humans do. They're not great just differences. Now, say Egyptians, medieval period, they worked with a different concept called hieratic scale, where your size depended on your importance. If that were true, oh, wouldn't a piece of cake decorated in here. You'd just put whatever who was ever most important in the center, and then lesser people could be, and less and less most important, could go into the narrow spaces. But they, the Greeks face a different challenge. So that's the prelude for the reconstructions of the West pediment. Then I'm gonna look at some fragments. This part, this is the Apollo and this figure. But first to tell you the story and you can get the general sense of it. Uh, <clears throat> this is the battle of the Lapis, L-A-P-I-T-H and the centaurs. C-E-N-T-A-U-R-S. Uh, this is a beloved story in both Greek and Roman art uh, because it had a moral that was fairly easy to understand. Um, so go, go back. The source of the story was Apollo had these two sons by one of his many consorts. Uh, one was named Lapithus and one was named Centaurus. And the uh, Centaurus was in some way slightly deformed. I think any myth that I know tells exactly how. And so Lapithus and Centaurus subsequently married. Lapithus married other women in a mythical tribe in Northern Greece. They're the, so they're the Lapis. Centaurus mated with mares, female horses, and produced the centaurs. Okay, so that's the genesis of the people here. That also explains why there's Apollo. These are ultimately all his offspring. But the uh, rest of the story was that the mm, king of the Lapis had uh, held a wedding for his daughter named Hippodamia. Hippo means horse, and that means she's important because. Horses were very important to the Greeks and very expensive. Um, and to this wedding, he did as you do. <laughs> you invite your relatives. Well, sometimes your relatives don't behave as you'd like them to behave. And the centaurs at this wedding got drunk. And not only did they get drunk, but then they tried to carry off Hippodamia and they 
chased after uh, all the Lapis women. So you have this melee here, and that's how this neat trick for getting into the narrower spaces is you could have people bending over, leaning over, crouching. So you go from the God who's the only immortal here, so he's, he can be big, and then the mortals in their different positions and centaurs already since their, their bodies go lengthwise, you know, they don't have to be tall. So that's the story. But now what I want to emphasize is the presentation of a poem in the middle of this. It's gonna look better when you see the real figure, but he's in pieces. So we just look at that. This, uh, this is actually for the Apollo is a better version. He is unmoved by any of this. He simply makes a commanding gesture and looks to one side and all this mayhem goes on around him. This is the kind of God Apollo that when philosophers in the 19th and 20th century are talking about having an Apollonian or a Dionysiac personality or point of view, Apollo represents moderation, reason, uh, restraint. In Dionysia, of course, that's excess, um, drunkenness, free expressivity, free creativity. I should say for this, the concept of Apollo as this freedom and, and restraint, there is on the Temple of Apollo, there was on the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, written that very famous phrase, nothing in excess. Well, here he is. This is mm, about 470 BC. <clears throat> At a time in Greek art, that's just called the severe style as a nickname by people because no, no one in sculpture is sh shown smiling. They all have these very sober faces. We have no idea why. And because in the period before that, everyone had a grin. So it has something to do with the different, um, either technical means when they're carving or something. Well, we, we don't really understand. But there he is in his just full frontal glory with that gesture out here and then the struggle. Here, I'm going to show you her and the center here in a moment. And again, uh, as we saw with that one Apollo, just a little drapery, like uh, you're looking at something in a jeweler's case, and that's the velvet behind it. And here's his face. Now, of course, these are all painted, and you can see just a little faint bit of where the paint was on the eye. But he's utterly imperturbable. So she's struggling as the centaur has grasped her by the breast um, with his human hands on her torso, and then he's using one of his legs to keep her in place. But the centaur, as a subhuman being, can grimace. They can show expression. So there is this message in this, this, this is, which is in, always in the story of the Lapis and the centaurs. It is about the, the human capacity to exercise self-control is what sets us off from all the rest of the animal kingdom. Then quickly, just some Greek pot paintings of what, what he looked like. This is to remind you that now what we see is cold white stone was uh, often colorful and that People wore colorful embroidered clothing. And here he is with his instrument. This is about mid sixth century. Um, another one where he's playing. He looks remarkably useful here, doesn't he? 
and that makes him look quite feminine with his hair. We'd say it's a woman's hairstyle man. But you know this, he's young enough that he hasn't had to sacrifice his hair. And here, this is the inside of a white, uh, sort of like a chalky background, but this is a drinking cup. You'd drink down and here you would find him with his smile. And he's pouring a libation, a sort of a gift to the gods. He's pouring out of this bowl. And the raven is his bird. Also has to do with being the oracle. Here, his kithra, even, this is to represent that's a tortoise shell. This is a Roman one, terrible. I only brought one image to show him among the gods because it feels like an obligation to show it to you. There are many paintings that show Apollo among the muses. Um, that's what I mean, not, not among the gods, but among the muses. Uh, <clears throat> but they tend to be multifigured and hard to reproduce. So I just stuck with the most famous, which I'm assuming some of you also have seen. It's in the Vatican Palace in the room they're now called the Raphael Rooms. Um, this, if you've taken any art history, I'm sure you have not escaped looking at this painting, the School of Athens. It's a room where the Curia met. It's called a room of signatures. But on the four walls, Raphael, who's painting for Julius II, the Pope who brought um, that statue of Apollo, um, to the Vatican, um, was commissioned to do this room with the frescoes that showed the four realms of uh, like human learning. There was, here's theology, then these are the arts, and then on the one wall was uh, law. Oh dear, I can't remember what the fourth one is. Well, I don't remember there were. And here it is, cleaned. I find myself so singularly unmoved by this. And here he is playing a contemporary instrument rather than the lyre. And then there are the nine muses around him, nine ancient poets and nine contemporary poets. The ancient poets, this would be blind Homer here. It's based on a head of a sculpture, not of Homer. Here's Dante, and here's Virgil, and here's the only woman that's the poet Sappho. And I'll show you a drawing he did just of that head. There they are. I so prefer to the final work. Two minutes, I'll tell you the story. I'll repeat the story next time and we'll stop with that. Because uh, we're gonna start with a myth of Apollo and Daphne. Oh my goodness. What a, almost better not to look at an image. Let me go back to do this whole way, look at this. What a terrible image it is to imagine, to visualize. The story is that Apollo, fresh and cocky from having slain that python, uh, comes across Eros or Cupid, and he's sort of like in great braggadocios saying to Cupid, you know, bow and arrow is a weapon for the grown-ups, you know, it's not something to play with. And Cupid then gets his revenge because he takes two arrows, a gold arrow, which is the arrow of love, and he, and he and shoots Apollo with that arrow. And then there was a nymph, Daphne, who actually, like Apollo's sister, wanted always to stay a virgin goddess and loved to be in the wilds and the woods with all the creatures. She was a daughter of a river god and she, she just loved the woods. Um, Daphne fled from any man and Cupid, then um, shot a lead arrow into her, which makes her even men even more repugnant. 
So Apollo sees Daphne. He's just been smitten with that. So he feels passionately in love with her. And she races away from him. And uh, Apollo is the fleetest of the gods. He's supposed to ultimately catch up with her. But um, ultimately, uh, uh, Eros helps him a little bit. So he reaches Daphne. And she, in terror, uh, in desperation, cries out to her father, who had been wanting to have grandchildren, uh, but cries out to her father to please rescue her. And her father does by turning her into a tree, the laurel tree, the bay laurel. And Apollo uh, reaches her just as when he touches her, but that's when she turns into a tree. But Apollo never lets go of her. He says, I will always have you with me. So he always wears the laurel crown. And um, I think there are other places in his costume that there's something about the laurel. So I'm going to show you many images that, of that story of the chase, the danger of being captured by a god, of love, of courtly love. Oh, my goodness, it's loved in the Renaissance. And can you imagine for any visual artist, how are you going to show a woman being turned into a tree? So that's what we'll look at next time. Goodbye. Oh, again, of course, if there are questions, I'll take them in the chat room. No questions, Maggie, but I must say this was once again very informative and I cannot get my video going. But we appreciate what you <laughs> So do. you're looking at me with who's looking at me? You're looking at me with yes, an icon oh, camera. Well. Yes, the video won't go on. <laughs> but thank you so much. Sure, sure. Yeah, not a single question. Okay. Well, the Shapiros know what to expect next time. <laughs>